Good morning, folks. Um, we have quite a crew uh, of folks with us uh, here at 1030. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the Universal Meals Program uh, that we've spent quite a lot of time on in the last uh, few years, and especially last session. And hopefully, um, we'll get a, an update on how things are going and where uh, we need to push and promote and and help to make it even even a better program. So um, I think that it would be good for the committee to introduce themselves and we'll start with Chris. Hi everybody, Chris Pearson, Senator from Chittenden. Hi, I'm Anthony Polina, Washington County. Brian Collimore from Rutland County. And Corey Parent from Franklin County in Alberg. Yeah, and I'm Bobby Starr from Essex in Orleans County, and certainly want to welcome all of you folks uh, to our meeting this morning. And uh, I don't know, Betsy, if you're going to want to lead off, uh, but uh, you're first on my list, so we'll start with you and maybe you could introduce uh, the other guests as we move forward. Sure, happy to. Thank you, Senator Starr. Good morning, yeah. everyone. My name is Betsy Rosenbluth. I'm the project director of Vermont Feed, which is a partnership of Shelburne Farms and NOFA Vermont. And I also coordinate the Vermont Farm to School Network. And first, I just want to thank you all for your support and good work last session, doing what we can to support Vermont families so kids are not going to bed hungry and um, also not distracted at school by hunger. Every Vermonter needs access to the nourishing food that we produce in this state so that while we address food security, we're also helping our Vermont farmers and agricultural economy. So I know this committee understands that win-win so well, thank you. Uh, so towards this goal of improving food security while expanding markets for Vermont producers, uh, we know we can make a difference this year by ensuring families do not lose universal school meals after this school year by passing the universal school meals bill S100 with both breakfast and lunch included investing in the local purchasing incentive that was passed last year with one-time funding to get it started. So we need ongoing funding and estimate that it will cost about 500,000 for FY23. Fully funding the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grants Program at 500,000 base funding. That's seeing greater demand than ever. And Trevor with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture will talk more about that and uh, supporting the Vermont Food Bank to continue their pandemic response in the face of rising food secure insecurity in our state. So there's a one page summary of this that um, I had submitted to Linda that you guys have access to um, and we'll tell you the status of those. Um, and these programs, what I really want to say, they all work together to help support Vermont families and Vermont children, especially looking forward as we recover from the pandemic. So we're gonna talk about those pieces um, and can answer any questions along the way. We're gonna share that presentation with you. The local yep. food incentive grant received one-time funding and we're asking for the base funding of 500,000 for FY23. Um, and I just want to note a few things that we've seen. Um, those applications from SUs are due actually this Friday, uh, January 15th. So we'll have a lot more information to share with you after that. But anecdotally, what I hear from school nutrition directors is as many products became harder for school nutrition programs to find, local foods this year remained available to source like Vermont beef, maple syrup, and local dairy in particular. Uh, we also 
<clears throat> have counted up that over a hundred Vermont farms now provide food to feed our youth across the state through school nutrition programs and early childhood programs. So we're excited about that strong connection in every corner of the state. Um, Vermont Feed has reached out to every SU in the state both the business office personnel and school nutrition directors to spread awareness of the local food incentives grant opportunity. Um, we've been helping uh, on answering questions and adding resources to our website, completing applications, plans for tracking local food or connecting with producers and procurement support. The feedback is really positive. Um, SUs really want to, really need this grant to increase local purchasing. The barrier they talk about is really always budgetary. It's not a lack of desire. <clears throat> and so I think we're on the right track that providing this grant opportunity to SUs is essential for getting more local food to Vermont kids and directing more dollars to Vermont farmers. Um, and there's a clear need for technical assistance. I think in the tools, tracking tools and other kinds of um, resources that we've been working on, product lists with key distributors, et cetera. Um, and we've been providing that technical assistance as best as we can. There's no support from the state for doing that. Um, and that's where the grants program comes in. We're hoping an increase in the grants program can help sustain this kind of support to the SU so that they can take full advantage of the local purchasing incentive grant. Um, and the grant program itself, I'm, I'll leave it to Trevor to talk more about, but it's been really flexible in meeting an increased demand. I think we've had record number of applications in the past year, even in this really stressful couple of years that schools and early childhood providers <clears throat> are in the midst of. Um, and the Agency of Agriculture has been very flexible in um, different programming like CSA, uh, subsidized CSA shares for early childhood programs. Our goal has been to expand nutrition services for really young children. And these grants have been critical for doing that. I think especially the age when their tastes are developing and um, families are so involved in their care. Um, so we are, again, asking that we fully fund that grant program at base appropriation of 500,000 for FY23. And it would help support not only the technical assistance, but more schools and more early childhood programs um, to be able to expand farm to school. And um, for new schools, we really see the opportunity with Vermont's harvest of the month. Um, and we're hoping to make an investment and expansion in that program. So for those schools who've not been as active, there's an entry point to begin to buy local, to begin to do um, educational activities with kids. So that's, I just wanted to frame that out a little bit and then, uh, turn things over. Um, and I don't know if we want to answer questions as we go or wait till the end. I think either way works for us. Well, uh, maybe uh, one question that I picked up, I think that we need to answer. Um, do you know if the 500,000 for the uh, grants program, uh, did that get into the budget or is this something that we're gonna need to do um, through a bill or in appropriations? For the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grants Program? Yes. Yeah, uh, I have not seen uh, what's been included in the ad administration's budget, so I can't. I can't answer that. And the yep. same with the local purchasing incentive, I'm not sure. And how much is that 500 as well, Betsy? That's right. That's what we so said. There's two, mm -hmm. two, two requests, 500 each. That's right. 
Yeah. And any other questions uh, at this point? If not, um, our next uh, guest to speak, is it Trevor? Good morning, Trevor. Good morning, Senator Starr um, and other senators. Thanks for inviting me to speak. Uh, my name is Trevor Lowell. I am the program manager for the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grant Programs through the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. So I manage the $171,000 annual allocation that funds um, currently three grants that are targeted at um, schools and early childhood programs and helping them support a variety of farm to school goals. Um, I can provide kind of a summary of those programs if that's helpful and then speak a little more to how um, those relate to supporting universal meals. Um, and then talk a little bit more about some of the other work that we're doing to support the local incentive um, purchasing grant as well, and then answer any questions that folks might have. So we currently offer three different grants through this program. There's the Farm to School Early Childhood Grant, which is a combination of um, technical assistance and a financial award that's open to schools and early childhood providers. Um, we also offer a CSA grant as Betsy mentioned, that's a new grant program that was first offered last year that um, subsidizes the cost of CSA or farm shares for early childhood providers. We cover 80% of the cost um, for applicants that are awarded that grant. We had um, really great interest in that. We had 46 applicants for that program last year. We were able to fund 31 of them um, in 12 counties across the state we awarded about $23,000 and all of that money went to Vermont Farms. So 23 different farms benefited from that program and over a thousand children benefited from receiving food through that grant program as well. Uh, the third grant that we have is the Farm to School Vision Grant. So that was a new grant last year as well. We plan to offer that again. And that is really targeted at um, trying to find kind of innovative solutions within the farm to school space to contemporary problems. Mm -hmm. So the grant last year went to South Hero Land Trust for a project that they're doing to integrate anti-racist education into their farm to school programming. Um, so those are the three buckets. As, as Betsy mentioned, we had um, a lot of interest in all of the grant programs, the farm to school, an early childhood grant program is the one that's been around the longest. And this last round, we just closed and awarded seven new applicants, but we had 25 applications, 15 from early childhood providers, um, and 10 from schools and SUs. So, you know, to put that in a financial context, there was $273,000 in grant requests just for that program alone. And we awarded $75,000 to those um, schools and ECEs that were selected. Um, so lots of interest and also I think important to put that in context of obviously, you know, COVID is pre presenting lots of challenges for schools and reducing just overall capacity. So I think interesting to know that um, even in these trying times, this grant program is still a, you know, really valuable resource for schools and ECEs. Um, the other thing I wanted to say there too is that they, the eligibility within that program of ECEs is relatively new. So it's about three or four years that we've um, started accepting applications from early childhood. That's been a really exciting development. I think a lot of the um, strategy that we're focused on along with our partners at Shelburne and NOFA and Hunger Free and Vermont Community Garden Network is really kind of expanding this continuum of support around farm to school and farm to early childhood. So understanding that farm to school doesn't have to start at K-12 and really it shouldn't. Ideally, you know, kids that are in childcare centers, in family home care provider centers um, are getting that type of support as well. So we've been working hard um, with the help of a grant that we are co-leading with Shelburne Farms um, to build a coalition around farm to early childhood and really kind of build up the structure and the support for that sector to make sure and then integrate it with the existing um, really robust farm to school network that we have here in Vermont. Um, also wanted to mention that we received a grant from USDA in 2020 
to help schools improve the quality and quantity of their tracking of local purchases. So this was a really timely grant with the local purchase incentive. Um, this is what's helped fund the creation of a local food track tracking um, tool that Betsy mentioned that's available. We've also been able to partner and bring in a lot of great voices from distributors and food hubs and food service directors to kind of understand what their challenges are and help support them. So we're taking that work that's ongoing. Um, the grant is still active right now, but um, continues to add value, I think, to the broader effort around increasing schools' ability to procure more local food. Um, Trevor, how much was that grant? It was a little south of $60,000. Um, and that NOFA Vermont is participating in that, um, Shelburne as well. Um, and then Northbound Ventures and Farm to Institution New England. So we have a great collaborative team of experts within the state that are all working together with a voluntary advisory panel of folks that um, have are just stakeholders within this, this area. Um, and then lastly, just wanted to kind of speak to the universal meals, given that that's kind of the topic that we're um, interested in today. So the the grants program is the main mechanism through which we support universal meals at the agency of ag. And that's really sort of a grantee driven um, approach. So the way the farm to school and early childhood grant works is that grantees really start the grant by identifying what do they want to accomplish with the funds and the technical assistance that's offered to them. And a lot of times that is universal meals, or that's just in, you know, improving participation in a meal program. There's specific technical assistance that's offered to every grantee through that program around their meal program and the viability of it. That's provided by Hunger Free Vermont. So if a grantee expresses interest in that, they get direct tech, technical assistance and support from Hunger Free um, and others um, to help, you know, achieve that goal and pursue that goal. So it's, and that way it's not, you know, it's part of the kind of broad tent of goals within the Farm to School Grants Program, but it is very grantee driven. So, you know, they decide you know, what do they want to accomplish with this and then we help them get there. They're able to use their funds to accomplish those goals or pursue those goals as well. So, and I think that's all I had, but I'm happy to take any questions if, if folks have them. Yeah, um, so, uh, Trevor, uh, your one hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars that you had advanced three grand. Uh, that is uh, the ag ag budget. Is that coming out of a different pot of money? That's the annual allocation from the general fund, I believe. And did that go up at all this year, or do you know? That's been steady the past few years. There was a one-time increase. I think the first year I started in 2019. Um, so the base funding has been 171 for several years, but I think in the past there's been a couple of years where that has been increased. Yeah. Uh, other questions from committee members for Trevor at this point? Uh, if not, um, we'll uh, thanks Trevor and we'll, uh, Chris has a question. Yeah, maybe it's, I don't think you got an answer or maybe Trevor knows it. it, it is, is some of this included in the governor's budget? Do you have that sense? Um, particularly the, the, the local food incentive money that we came up with last year was one-time money in the budget. So any idea, Trevor, and if that's not a fair question for you, I'm happy to send it to somebody else. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I saw it. Sorry. Yeah. I think we're going to probably have to be asking for, for the, you know, the right amount of money. Um, any other questions for Trevor at this point? If not, um, Betsy, who's who's up next? 
So Rosie is here from the Agency of Education oh. Child Nutrition Program. And, um, yeah. and then Faye Mack from Hunger Free Vermont can follow Rosie. Yeah. Good morning, Rosie. Good to see you. Good morning. Um, for the record, Rosie Kruger, the State Director of Child Nutrition Programs at the Agency of Education. Um, good to see you all. Um, so I'm going to just give you kind of a, a brief update on um, the work we've been doing this year. Uh, did not prepare any kind of written update for you, um, but can give you a brief overview and happy to answer any questions. Um, so as you're likely aware already, um, meals are still free to all kids 18 and under um, through USDA waivers, and that's through June of 2022, this coming June at this point. And that's been the case since March of 2020 um, due to COVID related waivers. USDA does not currently have the authority from Congress to extend those waivers further because um, they don't have authority to approve waivers that increase federal costs um, beyond that point. So uh, USDA at this point is advising us that next year we should expect things to look um, similar to how they had in the past. Of course, we've heard that from them before. Congress has acted at the last minute and things have, have changed on a dime. Um, and we've had to be very flexible with that. But at this point, um, we are looking at a situation where those waivers would be ending um, in June. Um, this year, unfortunately, schools haven't really been able to take as full advantage of those waivers um, as they were able to even last year. Um, schools are providing breakfast and lunch at no charge to students, but those waivers actually would allow us to um, offer after school snack and after school supper to students, um, as well as offering meals during unexpected school closures and offering meals to uh, children under 18 who are not students uh, or 18 and under who, who our community members, um, but not enrolled in schools. And because of staffing uh, capacity issues, um, not being able to hire staff or having staff out, um, just having uh, intense staffing shortages generally, a lot of our schools actually have scaled back their offerings um, and are not able to offer as much as they had uh, last year or have been able to offer uh, pre-COVID. So even though the funding is there, um, we don't really have the staff on the ground to be able to operate these programs to the fullest extent. It's really unfortunate, um, but there's not really a lot that you know we can do. We can make the funding available, um, but we can't create people uh, to, to do this work. Um, so that's where we are um, at right now. Um, and in general, we're hearing from the schools that they're just facing intense capacity issues. Um, and that comes into play when we're talking about grant programs. Um, as you know and heard before, the local foods incentive grant um, due date is coming up um, January 15th. And uh, we won't have a full picture until January 15th of who's actually applied, but we are hearing some reluctance from schools to apply for that grant because um, of staffing issues and general grant fatigue. There's been a lot of funding available um, from USDA and from other COVID funding sources. And, uh, you know, all that funding is generally available in the form of a grant where you have to sit down and fill out an application and go through a grant agreement and a lot of and submit reimbursement requests. And um, so it's not a matter of the funds not being there. It's a matter of the, the people to complete the grant applications and complete the paperwork are not available. We're also having some grant fatigue here at the Agency of Education. Um, so I just want to make you aware of all that because I think that often um, it's the very well-meaning uh, impulse of the legislature to jump in and create a grant program whenever there's a need. And those grant programs don't seem to be um, quite meeting the need of, of folks on the ground right now. And I would encourage you to this year when you're thinking about things, um, consider other ways where you can make funding automatically available um, to all uh, eligible entities without requiring a, a specific grant program. Um, so with the local foods incentive, we have heard from some folks who are reluctant to apply, even though the first year of that pro grant program is actually very easy. We've made a very simple application for it, um, but it's just, they don't have somebody to fill out that application or to figure out the details or, or really understand it all um, because they're just trying to keep the lights on. Um, so that's kind of where things are at with, with those uh, programs. Um, last year, you created a universal meals task force um, consisting of the Secretary of Education or designee, Secretary of AHS or designee, and Secretary of Agriculture, Food and Markets or designee. Um, so I was designated the chair of that task force. Um, we've met a number of times this fall. 
who are drafting a report, uh, which we will vote on the final draft of that report tomorrow, and that will come to you by the 15th. Um, so I'm not going to speak too much to that um, because you'll be able to read the full report at that point. Nothing terribly new there. Um, a lot of the same information that we've been providing for you um, over the past few years, but hopefully in a, a useful format for you with a number of helpful suggestions for how to move forward. Um, I think that those are the updates that I had for you. So um, happy to answer any questions at this point. Yeah, uh, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So great to see you again, Rosie, as well. You mentioned a couple of factors, the lack of staff, and I think you call it grant fatigue, but that the funding is available. Where does that money go if it's not used? Are we in danger of losing it? Yeah, um, so there's a, a couple of different streams of funding. Um, so different things happen with different streams of funding. Um, so for the local foods incentive, um, that's state general fund. Uh, if they don't apply for it, then we'd tell you, you know, we only got applications for 300,000 of the 500,000 or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm drawing that number out of, out of air, but, um, we'll let, let you all know, um, how much was funded. And I assume at that point that the remaining amount would be, um, kind of rescinded and absorbed back into the general fund. Um, okay. For federal funding, uh, we have made really intense efforts to get those funds out the door. So, for example, we had these emergency operational funds uh, that went to schools who lost funds um, in the spring of 2020 compared to the previous spring. Um, and those were actually to schools and child cares. They ended up being pretty nominal gra grants, a few, uh, few thousand here and, and there. Um, some of the larger school districts received larger amounts of funding, but I believe in total, it was something like $200,000. Um, we got most of those out the door um, in the required timeframe, um, but there were a few folks who decided to, to turn the funds back because they um, felt uncertain about whether they had capacity or met the requirements. Uh, that goes back to USDA. Um, mm -hmm. We have some, uh, we received a very nominal amount of administrative funding for PEBT um, that went to the schools. The schools were given the opportunity to apply or not. Um, a number of them, you know, it ended up being like $600, $600 $1,000 per school, you know, pretty nominal amounts. And so a lot of them decided not to apply for those funds. Um, those went back to USCA. Those were all grants where this, had they filled out the form um, and uh, signed the grant agreement, they would have gotten the funds. It wasn't competitive. Uh, but even so, it was just, you know, too much, too much paperwork uh, in a short period of time, um, given their other constraints. Um, we offered uh, in 2020, um, we offered two um, pots of CRF funding um, that the legislature had made available, one for um, offering summer meals in summer 2020 and one for school equipment um, in fall of 2020. Um, we didn't end up using the full amount um, that we were allocated. And so those went back in to be reallocated for other CRF purposes. Um, so I'm not sure I've got all of them, but kind of that's, you know, generally they get returned to whatever the, the source of funds was initially, I guess is the short answer to that question. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Senator Pearson. Rosie, uh, I can appreciate uh, particularly what you're saying with the overworked and uh, you know, our schools are just beleaguered right now. So you could imagine how the energy it takes to apply for $600 or $1,000 grant is not worth it. Um, but I guess it's always, you, you know, that could equate to in a normal year, a chunk of the unpaid school balance or whatever from parents. And, you know, so, um, this committee uh, is sort of famous for trying to help um, smaller organizations, towns or what have you um, that don't have staff apply for grants. And has there been any thought um, to, to that approach, you know, a temporary person at in the agency that could just bang out one after another and, and cumulatively it ends up being a significant amount of money. And so just, 
I don't mean to suggest you should have done this. I, I, I really don't. I know it's just too much already, but I'm wondering if there would be wisdom for us to think about that kind of approach. I mean, I think, as you know, getting, um, getting positions is always its own challenge um, and conversation between the legislature and the administration. Um, so we haven't particularly pursued that in the child nutrition world. Um, I'm not really sure about the rest of the agency's COVID response. Um, I know that there's been some, um, some attempts to assist folks um, with other COVID related funding. Um, I'm not sure what form those have taken. Um, we do, you know, using the, the local foods incentive uh, program, you, you provided a permanent position to us uh, through that. Um, and we told you that we needed that to get that up and running and we certainly did. Um, so we were able to hire um, a very good candidate um, for that position, Connor Floyd. Um, he had previously worked at um, Food Connects, one of the um, food hubs in Southern Vermont. Um, and so he was able to get that program up and running um, and has also been working on a number of our other grant programs and is trying to provide a lot of hands-on assistance to folks and also to make sure that any grant applications we create are as simple as possible that, you know, if there's any data that we have here at the agency already, we fill that in for folks, um, just trying to make things as user-friendly as possible. But ultimately, we can't apply on their behalf. Somebody at the supervisory union office needs to click that, you know, I authorize, I certify button. Um, and if they don't have the time to understand what they're applying for and what they're committing to, um, they're, they're not ready to do that. Um, and so I think it's, that's, that, that's, yeah, I should have been more clear. That was really the nature of my question is, would it work? And, and I'm talking about the USDA, some of those grants that effectively were leaving that money on the table. Um, but you're saying it has to come directly from the local folks. And are those online applications or paper or what? Uh, we're doing everything electronically. Um, sometimes we're using, uh, program called Cognito to make a web form where they can apply. Um, other times we've been using the agency's grant management system. We do still have a process that we call a, a paper grant, but it is a, a PDF. It's all electronic. We're not having anybody mail anything at this point. So it'd be hard for a centralized person to get it all done and then say, sign here and we'll get you a thousand bucks. You know? Yeah. And I just, I don't know that, you know, uh, a business manager and a, and a supervisory union needs to understand what they're applying for and what they're committing to. And so, um, you know, it's sort of like, hey, don't read the fine print, just put your signature here. And that wouldn't really be a responsible thing for them to be doing. Um, so I, I, I would be a little hesitant to go down that road. Um, and I think they would be as well. Thanks. But certainly we, we do try to make the grant out any grant applications so, we make, we try to simplify as much as possible um, and not ask for stuff that we don't need to ask for. And, and that's really a concerted effort on our part. Earlier, Rosie, uh, you said that uh, if we if we change the law or the rules, uh, loosening them up, loosening up the rules or regs that you could maybe get some of this grant money out faster? Did, did you say that? Or? I don't think I said that specifically, but just urging you, you know, as you're thinking about, you know, what steps you're gonna take this year, um, I would urge you to not create new grant programs um, or, you know, think about ways that you can um, add additional funding if that's your goal. Um, in a way that kind of automatically goes to the school food authorities without them having to do extra work. And as we've talked about before, um, you know, the, the way that I always recommend doing that is to increase that pot of funding that we call the state match funding. Um, and that's uh, a set amount of funding that the state appropriates from general fund that gets divided among all school food authorities every year based on the number of meals that they serve between June and December. And it's just an automatic calculation and they get a check for it. Um, by participating in the school meals programs, they're eligible for it. And um, whatever amount of money is available gets divided up among them evenly based on the number of meals that they've already served. We do the math here at the agency. We issue the payment. They don't have to sign anything extra. They just get that payment. And so, you know, right now you give a certain amount 
if you increase that, you know, by $20,000, then that additional amount gets divided up among everybody. If you increase it by 100,000, that additional amount gets divided up, up among everybody. So if you just want to get funds to schools without extra paperwork for anybody, um, that is the, the best and simplest way. Um, no additional work for us here at the agency and no additional work for the schools. And that goes into the nonprofit school food service account and has to be spent on child nutrition program related costs. So why couldn't we put something in the law or that if you have extra money from a grant program, that it would automatically revert to the state match funds pot rather than getting sent back to the general fund or to some other division? I think you so, could certainly could do that we, with state general funds. Do something where that money would, would revert to the state match fund? I think you could certainly do that with state general funds. Um, I don't think you could do that with, with USDA funds or, or other um, non-state non uh, non sources of funding, but I think you have the authority to do that with general funds. Because it's, it's really bad to have federal funds go back go back that we can't use it and we couldn't figure out a way to refunnel that that money for the same purpose but to a different pot that would give you leeway to get it back out to the school districts a lot of the funds that come from usda okay. have very specific uh, requirements Same. about how they're to be granted out. So we don't have authority to do that with most of the USDA funding. No, no. Uh, other questions for Rosie at this point in time? If not, um, our next person is it Fag, uh, Chris. Well, I just want to say thanks, Rosie. We put you through a lot, I feel like. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate your your forthright manner and, and all the hard work you and your staff are doing. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Well, good morning, Faye. Good morning, Senator Starr. Good morning, committee. Uh, my name is Faye Mack from the Advocacy and Education Director at Hunger Free Vermont. It's nice to be back and see all of you today. Um, and thank you for having us here for this overview. This is really helpful to do. Um, so before I share um, a little bit about universal school meals, I wanted to just step back a bit. And I, I think that Carrie from the Food Bank will also have some context to share as well. Um, but I wanted to just say a little bit about what's happening right now in Vermont with hunger, um, which is part of the reason that we're here with all of these different programs to make sure that people have access to food. Um, and, and what I really want to share is that people in Vermont are still struggling. Um, families with kids are still struggling, older adults across the age spectrum. Um, hunger remains high and remains a pretty dire um, situation for a lot of people across the state. Um, there have been a lot of inter interventions from both the federal government and from you all and the legislature and the state government over the course of the pandemic to address the increased need with hunger and um, job loss and housing and economic security and, and all that a lot of folks are facing. Um, but much of that has been temporary and many of the aids um, and assistance that has been provided are ending. Um, so the, one of the big ones that affects um, kids in school, which is part of what we're here to talk about today, um, is the child tax credit at the federal level and that expansion has ended. And one thing that I think is just important to share with you all is that all of these interventions have made a huge difference for people, but they've made a temporary difference. So while they're in place and families are getting extra money every month through the child tax credit or three scores a month benefits are temporarily higher than they normally would be, all of these make a very big difference. But the minute they're gone, that support and that, that sense of, of breathing room is gone for folks. Um, so what we're talking about with um, 
with school meal programs and um, some of the other requests um, that our, our group of organizations have for the legislature this year is really about taking a look at what has worked well and making those interventions permanent um, and meeting that need in a higher way because the need doesn't, it isn't disappearing, it's not going away. Um, and that's what we expected, right? We expected that the economic recovery um, and things like hunger would remain high um, even as the economy recovers um, and, and we move forward through this pandemic. Um, I'm done saying when we end the pandemic, but, but as we continue to move forward through it, um, we need to start to make some of these efforts, uh, efforts last. And so in that vein, um, you know, we're really excited to continue to work with you all um, to pass the Universal School Meals Bill. Um, so you all did so much work on this last year and, um, and we're really grateful for the progress that was made. And we at Hunger Free Vermont and all of our partners are really um, pushing to, to have that bill passed this year for breakfast and lunch um, and to make Universal School Meals permanent. Um, some of what you just heard from Rosie especially is really just the the enormous stress and pressure that school meal programs, um, school nutrition professionals, agency of education, all the folks who are making school meals happen, um, they're, they're under a lot of pressure and stress and making universal school meals permanent will help help ease that in, a, in an ongoing way. Um, as Rosie mentioned, the waivers that are allowing for schools to provide universal school meals now are set to end at the end of the school year. And as of now, we don't expect them to be extended. Um, so that means that we would be asking schools to recalibrate their programs all over again, reintroduce um, school meal applications, reintroduce cash registers, and, um, and basically restart a different program um, for the school meal program rather than continue with the program that has been happening um, and has been in place in all schools for a couple of years now. Um, the other nice thing too about universal school meals that I'll highlight is that the funding structure, um, it's not a grant program. Um, it is an automatic reimbursement, um, you know, so school, it is a, a per plate reimbursement as Rosie was mentioning um, as something that works really well for the agency of education and for schools. So schools would be receiving funding based on the meal served um, and they'd be receiving it as a reimbursement um, without having to apply for a grant. Um, so making pass, passing S100 this year, making universal school meals permanent um, is a way to help schools and school meal programs continue on the path that they're already on without adding you know, a big administrative and burden over the summer to try to readjust the program and, um, and keeps children and families whole um, from having to lose school meal programs um, to have to lose their free breakfast and lunch and having to readjust to a whole different program that brings back the stigma and the shame and the um, separation based on income that we see in cafeterias under old programs. So, you know, really that's, that's what I wanted to share. Um, I'll, as, as was in that document that Betsy said, just as a, a reminder of where S100 landed. So right now it's in the House Education Committee. Um, and so we are, are hopeful that we'll be able to uh, work with that committee and go in and testify there and um, help keep that bill moving and send it back all on over to you all um, with both breakfast and lunch included. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions about any of that or share anything else that would be useful. Uh, Faye, uh, have you, have you uh, had an opportunity to appear in house education in regards to uh, the bill? Not yet. No. And because we sent it over with just a breakfast program, didn't we? Yeah, so uh, it passed the Senate with just breakfast included, um, and then it included a number, a number of other pieces that were passed in other legislation. So the task force that Rosie mentioned earlier, um, that was included as well as other language. So the, the nice thing is that the bill can be very simple. 
um, this year. Um, a lot of the different pieces were addressed last year. The staff person for the Agency of Education, Rosie mentioned that Connor Floyd has been hired. Um, so, so really, it's um, what needs to be included is universal school breakfast and lunch in all schools and the funding mechanism, which we continue to advocate that the funding needed, the cost that's not covered by the federal government be paid for collectively through the education front through categorical aid rather than um, putting that burden on individual communities and school budgets to, to navigate. Uh, Kate Webb is the chair, right? She is, and we yeah. were we did go in last year. So I will say we were um, working with that committee. They were making progress on the bill last year and just ran out of time before the session ended. So we're hopeful that they'll be picking it back up and we'll be able to to keep moving forward. Boy, that would it would be great if we could get that passed. That's for sure. Um, yeah. So uh, other questions for uh, Faye. I guess we're good, Faye. All right, um, thank you so much. Yeah, it's gonna be very important for us to keep uh, you know, up to speed on this. So if, you know, if we can help or if you think we can help, let us know and with our colleagues on the other uh, I think would be uh, very supportive of this on the House side. Uh, I haven't chatted with Carolyn yet, but um, you know, if you can get two or three other committees promoting an issue, it would certainly help add count the numbers and and get the numbers to pass it. Absolutely. Uh, well, we are happy to keep you Anything posted. Anything else for Faye, right? Yeah, well, good. Um, if um, if not, uh, I guess Faye will move on to Carrie from the food bank. Hi, everybody. Morning, um, Carrie. It's morning. It's nice to see all of you and, and meet many of you. I don't know that I've met you before. My name is Carrie Staler and I am the government and public affairs officer for the Vermont Food Bank. Um, my role is relatively new. So I started with the food bank in uh, late August. Um, and I'm really here to, to do what Faye was talking about today is to sort of help paint a picture of where food insecurity is at in the state of Vermont right now. Um, and to talk to you a little bit about the funding that we're seeking to continue to support food insecure Vermonters and Vermonters experiencing hunger through the work we do. Um, Linda has a document to share and if you if you want to share that right now Linda it'll save everybody having to look at one more talking head um, for a hey, minute and <laughs> I'll get it on here. <laughs> well visual variety. Um, so just for perspective, this year the Vermont Food Bank is seeking um, $6 million in budget appropriation funds, uh, sorry, budget adjustment funds, and that um, is with the House Appropriations Committee, and um, we've been speaking with House Human Services as well, and that work is to address pandemic um, response specifically. Um, and then we're also asking for $6 million for fiscal year 23 funding to support pandemic relief work. Um, really what we're seeing and anticipating is that the need will continue to be high and that need will be sustained for the foreseeable future. So this is a document we put together to sort of help understand what, where, where food insecurity was prior to the pandemic and where it is now. So you can see the number across the top, 27% of people in Vermont are experiencing food insecurity. Most of this data comes from the NFACT research team at UVM and Drs. Farrell Bertman and Meredith Niles. Um, and I can provide the committee with links to their research if you'd like that afterwards to understand a little more deeply what's going on. But I think the big takeaways here are that prior to the pandemic in 2019, the USDA 
um, told us that food insecurity rate in Vermont was 9.6%. While that was not a fantastic percent, compared to the current rate of 27%, 9.6 seems um, like an ideal dream. We're really, uh, you know, at the, at the height of the pandemic, we were up to about 31%. We're coming down very slowly. Um, this is something that we've seen in prior crises like the um, Great Recession in 2008. It took about 10 years for Vermont to return back to the pre-recession food insecurity rate. So we're again seeing that kind of trend with the pandemic that, that while the economy itself may be recovering, um, food insecure households are re recovering much more slowly. Specifically, certain demographic groups are experiencing that uh, at a lot higher rate than others. So families with children are experiencing food insecurity at about a 5.1 um, times higher rate than, than families without children. That's why it's so important to, that my you know, colleagues are here from Hunger Free and, and Betsy's here with Feed. These school meal programs um, are really key to helping to support those families who are experiencing food insecurity and provide stability for those children um, the other group that really uh, was challenged during the pandemic were households that experienced job disruptions. The gentleman we um, have featured on this is Tom. He, he was a taxi driver and a volunteer EMT. His taxi job disappeared during the height of the pandemic. He has been able to get back to work, but that loss of work was a real setback for him. And so he needed the support of public and community and federal meal programs in order to access food. Um, Linda, if you scroll down, um, the other one that really surprised all of us at the food bank on this was that, that women were seven times more likely to experience food insecurity, 7.3, um, exactly. And we know that women often have lower incomes, women often have uh, less secure social security. There are a whole bunch of contributing financial security factors here, but just, um, the stark contrast of that 7.3 number was really um, eye-opening even to those of us who serve food insecure populations regularly. Um, thanks, Linda. I think that's it for this um, document. So that really sort of paints a broad picture of what food insecurity looks like from a data perspective. What I can also tell you is that from the perspective of the food bank's work, we are still seeing really heightened um, needs based on those who are accessing our programs and the amount of food that's that's going out of our distribution centers. So in 20, in our fiscal year 2020, our fiscal years are part of that we align with the federal fiscal years, but um, due to the pandemic, we distributed 19.6 million pounds of food. This past fiscal year that just ended in September for us, we distributed 17.6 million pounds of food. So still really high. Um, our initial calculations were that we would be down near 13 million pounds of food for this coming year ending in October or ending in September. That actually looks like it's going to be off and we're going to be up closer to 15 million pounds of food. So, you know, we're already seeing um, higher than estimated food access needs in the, the first three months of our fiscal year, you know, the last quarter of 2021. Um, one of the ways that we're able to measure that in particular is through our Veggie Van Gogh program, which um, I think you're all fam very familiar with our Vermonters Feeding Vermonters program, and that some of that produce does go out to people directly through our Veggie Van Goghs. Those were originally created to help hospital and school communities give better access to their patients and their families to produce. Right now, they're really kind of de facto food box programs now that the federal food box program has ended. So we're seeing really high turnouts at some of those, um, including our Newport Derby location, which is a new location that started during the pandemic. Uh, every month we've seen an increase for the past three or four months, we've seen an increase of about 100 households more per month. Um, we, we sort of hit what has been our pandemic record with 604 households accessing that Veggie Van Gogh site in December. Um, so overall throughout the pandemic, those Veggie Van Gogh events have seen about a 46% increase in households accessing that free fresh produce. Um, 
you know, understanding that people are using that in the same way they were using a food box program, we're looking at how to, how to better support families, particularly in those really high access regions like Newport or Bennington sites are seeing a lot. Springfield and Gifford Hospital both continue to see high turnouts for those. So um, really trying to make sure that people get their needs met through that. Um, and like Faye said, you know, and like I just mentioned, the federal programs that were available and the local programs that were available during the, the sort of higher peak of the pandemic, I'm not sure how to refer to it now, <laughs> um, previously in the pandemic, were really key to supporting people and their food needs. Um, but many of those have ended, rental assistance has ended, you know, now the child tax credit has also ended. So we're preparing um, and trying to be ready to make sure that, that we have the food and the, the resources that people need to access that food when those um, dips really hit households. And we're anticipating another one of those shortly as that child tax credit is not coming uh, to families in January. Um, I will also add that, that one of the questions we've gotten are who, who are these people who are accessing food? Who, who are these people who need this? And really a majority of people who are, who are food insecure in Vermont are working Vermonters they are employed, they do have income coming into their households, they don't have enough income to put enough food on their table for their family, um, or they're having to make really difficult choices between things like heat, housing, and food um, that is being made worse by inflation. Um, inflation is currently outpacing wage increases, and so we're really seeing this hit working families um, harder than other other crises maybe have in the past. Um, I will say that, that the funding that we have received from the legislature has allowed us to work with our 300 plus network partners and community partners to address local needs in ways that those local communities can best use. That's really what we're hoping to be able to do with the funding we're requesting from the legislature is continue to work with our network partners to understand those local needs and to provide the resources needed to, to address you know, each community's needs in its own way. Um, we know that food insecurity doesn't look the same for everyone in every part of the state. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions. I'm also, I can also give kind of a brief update on some of the um, Vermonters Feeding Vermonters work that we've been doing. And, and some of the $1 million we did receive in fiscal year 22 is going to support local farm um, food purchases. So if that's information that you would be interested in, I'm happy to do that, but I don't want to go on too long. Um, no. Well, thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, there are questions from committee members, Senator Pearson. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say most of us uh, are, 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 if not all of us, eager to, to help in any way we can. We, our focus has been on school meals. And I'm wondering if you have any data or even anecdotal sort of stories where that back up our, our belief that this is a key way to particularly the data about families with kids was stands out as, as greater rates of in, food insecurity. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you can kind of uh, help us understand the relationship such as you see it between school meals, making them more permanently accessible and, and our food insecurity generally. Well, I think that the fact that families with children are 5.1 times more likely to experience food insecurity might be that piece of data that you need. Um, we aren't necessarily talking to people who are using our services about whether they also use school meals. Um, I think the assumption is that while schools are offering those meals, families that are food insecure are likely using them. Um, that might be something that, that Hunger Free has a little bit better anecdotal stories about. Um, and I can, I'm happy to have a conversation with Faye and figure out if there's something that we can provide to the committee to support that. Yep. Um, thank you. Um, do you know, um, or could you tell us how are our Vermont producers, are they supplying quite a lot of food to the food bank, um, you know, from our, our 
for um, Vermont farmers? You know, I will say that um, our Vermonters Feeding Vermonters program started as a $500,000 a year program purchasing, um, you know, that that dollar well, amount from local farms. And that was done two ways. That was done through bulk purchases that were delivered directly to the food bank. So pallets of food where we had to work with the largest of our Vermont farms to do that because not everyone can deliver, you know, multiple pallets of potatoes. Um, and then the other portion of that is through grant funding to our local network partners, and they are able to purchase food directly from farms with that grant funding. So that means that smaller farms can support those, right. you know, those folks in those community food shelves. Um, that program was so successful, and the support that we received from the legislature really helped to establish that. And the food bank is looking at expanding that to $1.5 million this fiscal year. Um, knowing that that funding um, is available allows us to forward contract with farms so that they know to buy the seed, they know to plant, you know, that they can count on that funding coming through. So um, not only are we working on making sure that program is established and sustainable, but, you know, trying to expand that as we're able. And it looks like we'll be able to do that. You know, there, there are always, there's always more right? There's always more that we'd like to be able to do in that particular way. Um, and I will also say one of the things that we found with that program, we, I think we really based our model on Maine's model. And one of the things they said was when we purchase food from farms, they're more likely to donate food. And we found that as well. So farms that we're purchasing from are more likely to invite us to come glean on their farm and harvest produce after they've been able to sell it through their CSA or to their, you know, farmer's market or, you know, local wholesale clients. And that has meant more local food available to us to distribute as well. Yeah, that's, that's great. They're interacting and helping out, itching out the door to people that need it. Um, other questions for Carrie? No, I guess not. Well, thank you very much, Carrie, uh, for your time this morning. And I'm sure we'll, um, we'll be back in touch, uh, you know, and stay tuned with our food issues uh, with us. Yeah, thanks um, for the opportunity so, to be here. Yeah. Uh, Jean Hamilton. Uh, hi, Jean. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me in today. I'm Jean Hamilton, and I'm the statewide coordinator for the Vermont Everyone Eats program, which is housed out of SEVCA, the Southeast Vermont Community Action Agency, um, funded through a contract with ACCD. Um, I'm really excited to give you an update on Everyone Eats and tell you where we're going from here. Um, I did send some slides that I think Linda shared with you all. I'm not going to present them today, but they have a you know more detailed background for um, in, in case you're interested in diving deeper. Uh, so just as a refresher, Everyone Eats is an innovative program that um, we created together across the state. Um, it started in July of 2020 to really address some different mutual crises we were experiencing, particularly tied with this pandemic. So uh, significant, really damaging disruption to the restaurant economy and to the local farms and food producers who uh, service those restaurants as well as the uh, just outrageous rise in food insecurity that we just have been hearing about. Um, the, you know, prior to the launch, so between March and June of 2020, there were a number of grassroots initiatives that popped up around the state that used restaurants to make prepared meals for uh, vulnerable Vermonters and people experiencing food insecurity, as well as interest from the Mass Feeding Task Force in exploring a pilot project um, to actually do a state or federally funded program. And so all of that converged and we were invited into House Commerce to present this concept. Um, you all as a legislature approved a $5 million allocation from the CARES Act to get the program launched. We thought it would be a five month project. Uh, and since then, the program has extended again and again and again. Um, we're now going on over 18 months. 
It's a $24 million program that has uh, subsequently been 100% FEMA funded. So even that initial $5 million of CARES Act money um, went, you know, we did not end up using and instead uh, have received all of the funding for the program from FEMA. As recognition of this program being a, a part of Vermont's emergency feeding plan related to COVID. So the way the program works is that we buy prepared meals at $10 a meal from over 260 restaurants all around the state. Um, the meals are distributed through many, many diverse channels that are operated by 11 different community hubs. So the hubs um, you know, are on the ground in communities and really working with other partners like food shelves, health clinics, daycare centers, um, you know, pop-up meal distribution sites. So all, all manner of different sites to make the meals as accessible as possible to individuals and really leveraging that local knowledge of you know, where people are, where there are gaps in other food resources. And um, the meals are distributed to anybody who self-certifies that COVID has negatively impacted their access to food or are otherwise experiencing food insecurity. There's no application for them to fill out. They just need to be able to certify that they fall under that eligibility. Um, and they, uh, I'll just note that, you know, economics definitely play into that for people, but also issues of quarantining, um, you know, there are other reasons why people's food access may be limited that aren't economically based. Certainly school closures um, or having to stay home from school limits students access to school meals. So those are some of the reasons that we're seeing people access everyone eats meals. You know, of course, this has been a, a, a big source of supplemental income to restaurants. We are right now in the process of celebrating 2 million meals distributed. So that's $20 million that we've injected into the restaurant economy. Um, another cornerstone of this program has been that we did include a local purchasing mandate from the beginning. So all of the restaurants are um, asked to buy at least 10% of their ingredients from Vermont producers. And what we've seen is that the average is actually more like 37%. So really, uh, you know, a hallmark of um, all of the work that we've done together over the past decades to, to promote local purchasing, to build that expertise. Um, something that has been really exciting for me working on this program is seeing that we have some restaurants who are so expert at it, you know, and they're, they're buying lots and sometimes up to 85% of their ingredients are local. We also have many restaurants who have never purchased locally before, and this has been really a gateway for them where they felt they had to build some local purchasing relationships, and it's so exciting to see that um, developing with you know, different, different kinds of restaurants. So I'm really excited to share that success with you. And um, yeah, just there's so much I want to tell you, but I'll another sort of great success of this program has been the way that we've leveraged um, intersectionality, for lack of a better word. So really uh, working together across silos. We are operated um, under a steering committee that we call our task force, the Everyone Eats Task Force. It has about 20 members on it that represent the business community, the hunger relief community, three different state agencies. So ACCD, uh, Agency of Human Services and Agency of Agriculture. And it's just so interesting and exciting to look at issues like food security, um, local community economic development and local agriculture and food systems across these sectors rather than in silos. And the kind of work we've been able to do together to see how can an innovative program and a windfall like everyone eats plug into the landscape and really fill in gaps and find innovations has just worked so much better because we've been able to have conversations that are informed by these different stakeholder groups, you know, together looking at one goal rather than feeling in competition or, you know, more commonly just not in the same room. Um, so the program has now been extended to April 1st. We're really excited about that. We were um, supposed to end in December and just very nervous about ending this, this important program during the holidays and during the winter. Uh, we've been able to extend because, um, you know, one, just acknowledgement that the program is really successful. There's very much ongoing need, as we've just heard uh, from a food security perspective, also an economic perspective. Um, and then the other aspect is that FEMA at a federal level has, con has continued authorization to reimburse COVID expenses at 100%. 
rather than their normal 75%. So there was a sort of clear pathway for us to be able to extend that contract with ACCD. Um, so great news, we've got another three months of programming. Of course, the, the immediate impacts of um, that programming are a primary benefit, but you know, it's something that we've really been looking at over this last 18 months of working together is, is what are the lessons we're learning and what are the innovations we've developed that we can actually you know, bring, bring forward with us even beyond COVID. Um, so we're, we're deep in those conversations now with, with our task force, um, also you know, bridging over to the mass feeding task force um, and with our community hubs. Uh, and so some of the things we're working on right now, you know, sort of first and foremost, we're, we're thinking about what does it mean to continue this program? We did participate in the Nutrition Security Summit that happened last fall with USDA and FEMA and presented Everyone Eats interested in thinking about, you know, what are some, some possibilities for, for continuing to find federal funding to support this program? Um, and then otherwise, you know, what other funding sources are there that might continue to support this concept at different scales. We're also um, looking at how do we um, work together across other, uh, in partnership with other prepared meals providers. So the Meals on Wheels community, the school meals community to, to really you know, have like a strategic conversation about what's recognizing that prepared meals are such an important food resource and um, that we have some opportunities to strategize together to improve uh, some of our practices and to fill in some of the gaps that we know, you know people are falling into who need prepared meals but may not be eligible for some of the pre-existing prepared meals programs. I, you know, I think local purchasing is a really interesting theme to think about across these programs and so excited about the local purchasing incentive in schools and you know, lots of Meals on Wheels providers and, and the congregate and senior meals providers are, do have local supply chain relationships. And as we've learned from all of the local purchasing initiatives, it's just so much stronger if we can work together and really build that expertise and that technical assistance um, in a comprehensive way. Uh, so that's some of the work we're doing, you know, at the hub level, we're seeing some really interesting innovations um, from those organizations as they're thinking about, you know, potentially an end to the FEMA funded Everyone Eats because they know they want to keep doing this work. For example, Vermont Farmers Food Center in um, Rutland just got a $100,000 grant where they're going to, uh, once Everyone Eats is over, start hiring chefs to come into their food center and make prepared meals and actually use that as a workforce training program. You know, the um, Community Kitchen Academy is a great example of a really amazing program that we've had around for that the Food Bank and Capstone and others work on. Um, just again, really thinking about how do we bridge solutions across issues that are challenging our community, you know, around workforce development, around workforce for restaurants, around the restaurant economy, and around food security and local um, economic viability. A couple other just examples of some of the innovations that are coming out of our hubs. Um, there's an organization in Middlebury called The Giving Fridge that is looking to pilot some Amazon style uh, refrigerator and freezer locker so that they can actually have um, meals based in the community that are very easy to access um, and food safe. Chester Helping Hands and Springfield Family Center in the southern part of Vermont is uh, developing a community fundraising program with their restaurants where restaurants will actually list a menu item that says buy a meal for a neighbor um, and raise money so that people, you know, individuals can help support feeding their neighbors in that way. So those are some examples. Everyone Eats has been a tremendous, um, just an outrageous success. There are thousands and thousands of people who participate in this program in one shape or another. So many people think of this as their program and take a tremendous amount of pride in it. Um, you know, it's been really interesting to think about and to push the boundaries of what does it mean to be a very low barrier to entry program. Um, and also this reciprocal aspect of by receiving a meal, I'm helping a restaurant. You know, we've heard from many participants just how much that reduces the sense of shame and stigma and really increases the sense of um, pride in, in asking for help and uh, knowing that they're helping their community become stronger 
in that way. Um, so those are all themes that I, I'm so happy to share with you. I really encourage you to look for how everyone eats is showing up in your community. Um, in the slides I shared with you, you can see the list of community hubs. So you can see who's the community hub in your community. There's also a list of all of the participating restaurants. So definitely encourage you to frequent those restaurants and support them. Um, and then also really encourage you to think about how can we uh, leverage this momentum that we've had with this program to support other initiatives, um, you know, like we've talked about today here, but also just other initiatives that you see coming up in this session. Uh, we, we've just mobilized an incredible community of people behind this program um, and obviously brought a lot of money into the state. So it's, it's really an exciting moment. And finally, I um, want to acknowledge that this program really launched because of the visionary support of you all and your colleagues in the legislature. And so thank you so much for, for doing that. And um, yeah, just really proud of what we've been able to build together. Happy to take any questions or, you know, well, thank, you, thank you very, yeah. Uh, Senator Polina. Yeah, hi, it's, not, it's, it's a really good project, I agree. I was pleasantly surprised to hear you say that FEMA was funding it. I just, I, I didn't think that was the case. And I was gonna ask you initially whether you thought that was gonna continue, but I got the impression from what you said that we're not sure if it's gonna continue, but they seem to continue to extend it little bits here and there anyway. But if I remember correctly, you said that the restaurants get paid $10 a meal. Is that the case? That's right. But it, and when in doing that, how do you incentivize the local purchasing? Do they get an additional payment on top of that $10? Or how does that, how does that work? How do you encourage them to buy local? Yeah, great question. So we um, just require that restaurants purchase at least 10% of their ingredients locally. So that's, that's a, a baseline. Um, you know, what we've seen is that there's sort of a natural incentive. And I think we've seen this in, in a lot of other areas of local purchasing is that people actually find a lot of satisfaction in working with local vendors. Um, the, the quality of ingredients is very high. The, the sense of having a relationship with a local producer is satisfying and also marketable. And so, you know, what we find is once people get over the barrier of not knowing how to do it, that there's, there's sort of a natural incentive of wanting to do more. Um, I will say that, you know, $10 a meal for some restaurants feels like, oh, that's great. For others, it feels like that's not worth it for us. You know, with the really rapidly rising cost of ingredients, uh, you know, $10 a meal feels like less than it did two years ago. Um, mm. We also know that $10 a meal is, you know, relative to sort of what we see in the, in the charitable food system feels very high. I think the, the average reimbursement for Meals on Wheels is like $3.50 or something. So, you know, it's, it's a, pricing is a really interesting question. And um, we, we continue to look at it all the time with all of the sort of complexity of those impacts. So the buy local thing is kind of baked into the deal to begin with from the start. That's yeah. right. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's pretty good to get some of the restaurants are up to 37%. Uh, buying local foods. That's, that must have really helped out our timeshares and all our small uh, veggie producers around Vermont, especially during the summer. Uh, there are other questions for Jean? No. Uh, Corey, you all set? Yep. Um, well, thank, thank you very much for report is very uh, very and, and helpful thanks again and uh, Betsy uh, is there anything else that uh, or anyone else that we've missed that uh, we'd like to get on I think um, we've presented to you um, you know, what we see for this session that would make a difference and where things are. I think as we learn more about the budget and um, other things unfold, we'd be happy to circle back, Senator Starr, and um, keep you updated and um, let you know what the next steps are. Yeah, 
Well, we certainly uh, appreciate all the uh, testimony that we received this morning and certainly want to thank you and the rest of the panel that came in. Um, I know, you know, the committee's very interested in making sure that our people get fed and our children are, are fed and so uh, thanks to, for the offer of keeping us up to, up to speed on, on everything. Um, and certainly um, you know, on how the house is doing with, uh, with our bill on universal meals. Um, so <clears throat> if there are no other questions from any of the committee members and if you don't have anything else, uh, Betsy, um, thanks a lot for your, again, for your time this morning. We certainly uh, appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us today. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Thank you.